William Blake, the English mystic in the 18th century, wrote those words. Were Blake's words based on truth? Did those feet in ancient times walk upon England's mountains green? To find the answer to those questions, I went to Blake's England to research the many legends and traditions that Jesus spent some of his silent years between the ages of 12 and 30 in Britain. For two momentous months, I walked the English countryside in rain, sunshine, and then more rain to visit the sites of the traditions. I spent hours in libraries, museums, and churches reading half-forgotten records and interviewing the old folks of Cornwall and Somerset counties. All that was but the beginning of my quest, for I made subsequent journeys to Britain, each time verifying bits and pieces of the traditions from ancient records and related artifacts. I pictorially recorded some of my investigations, which I am now pleased to share with you. And as I do so, perhaps you will experience what I felt, a closer walk with him, as I looked for the meaning of those words, and was the Holy Lamb of God on England's pleasant pastures seen? Near the end of the first century BC, wise men of the Near East, called Magi in the New Testament, were convinced they had discovered a coming event of historical importance. These ancient stargazers observed a blazon nova in the heavens, which they believed was the sign heralding the birth of a new king, the long-awaited promised Messiah. The star of Bethlehem that inspired the Magi could well be the supernova recorded by Chinese astronomers in the constellation of Pisces about the time of the birth of Christ, an event that would not have gone unnoticed for the Magi. Hebrews had been in Babylonia from the beginning of the 6th century BC, so it is not only possible, but likely, that the Magi were of Hebrew extraction, in which case the traditional symbol in the heavens would have left no doubt in their minds. Soon they were on their way to Palestine. A supernova is a sudden nuclear reaction triggered off deep within a star, causing it to burn itself out with millions of times its normal energy output. So bright can it become that it can be seen in broad daylight. The end result was over a year-long journey by the wise men to visit Herod and the religious authorities of the day. The Magi made their way first to Jerusalem, asking, where is he that is born king? Then they made their way to Bethlehem, where the prophecy said a king would be born. In a cave in the side of a rocky hill, under an inn, the Son of God was born to the Virgin Mary. As the animals looked and wondered who were sharing their home that night, Mary wrapped the babe in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger of sweet-smelling hay. Then came the shepherds to kneel in adoration before the Christ child. It is believed the Magi took nearly a year to reach Bethlehem, and as in those days a child's age started at conception, Herod was told by the wise men that the newborn king could be up to two years of age. The massacre of the innocents, babes up to two years of age, followed the Magi's visit to Herod and is remembered for all times as a blot on world history and was another sinister sign of the old age conflict between evil and good, the serpent and the woman's seed, a conflict that reached the apex of infamy on Calvary. Jesus escaped the fate of the babes in Bethlehem, for an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream, saying, Arise and take the young child and his mother and flee to Egypt. Little is known of the boyhood of Jesus until at the age of 12 when he appeared before the learned rabbis in the temple at Jerusalem. Following a discourse in which he astonished the religious clergy with his knowledge. Then the scriptures give no record of his life till he appeared at the age of 30 at the river Jordan and was baptized by John. Where was Jesus between the ages of 12 and 30, the 18 silent years? 
The answer to our question may be found in the little Somerset County town of Glastonbury in southwest England, the center of the famous traditions of Glastonbury, relating to the silent years of Jesus. This map shows Glastonbury together with the nearby towns of Pilton and Pretty. The Mendip Hills shown are the center of the mining of lead, copper, and other metals that form alloys with tin. In the nearby parish church of Pilton, I found the first of many clues upholding the tradition of Jesus coming to Britain. It was a banner portraying Jesus as a young boy in a boat, accompanied by Joseph of Arimathea. The Bible record is vague about the younger brother of the father Mary, and thus being the great uncle of Jesus. The scriptures only state that he went boldly to Pilate after the crucifixion and asked for the body of Christ, his legal right under both Roman and Hebrew law, he being the next of kin. And if you're wondering why Joseph came often to Britain, the old records of the Pilton Church give one answer. They state, Joseph of Arimathea, a wealthy metal merchant, first traded here for lead and copper from Pilton and green ore from the Mendips. In the first century A.D., the Mendip Hills, north of Glastonbury, was the major source of lead and copper for the Roman world. And several historical documents exist that link Joseph of Arimathea with these mines. The earliest church historians of England refer to Joseph as Noblus de Curio. In the Roman world, a de Curio was one in charge of a mining district. I spent some time in the Mendips searching for the ancient lead mines. Everywhere I found evidence of long and intensive surface mining. Old debris piles, now covered with vegetation, open pits and trenches dotted the landscape. The lead mines of the Mendips have been worked intermittently for over 1,500 years, thus making it difficult to identify with certainty the original workings. Lead from the Mendips has been found in all parts of the Greco-Roman world, and as far east as Baalbek in Lebanon. Even the lead water pipes of Pompeii came from Britain. I was told that the old diggings could be identified by Roman pottery shards, usually found close by. Finally, my eye caught what I was looking for, a pottery shard exposed by weathering on the face of an old surface mine. Unmistakable, Roman pottery. Pieces of a bowl, probably accidentally dropped, and having no value broken, was just left where it had fallen. Covered by sand and dirt from floods and wind, the pieces had laid undisturbed since the first century AD. That was the age dated by the curator of the local museum by comparing with other pottery having similar features, collected by archaeological excavations in the area. Near where I found the Roman pottery were found several pigs or bars of lead bearing the stamp of Britannicus, the son of Claudius, Emperor Rome, thus proving that the mining of lead was going on here at the time of Christ. In 1956, four pigs of lead were found near Pilton, bearing the name of Emperor Vespasian of the Roman occupation of Britain, AD 69 to 79. At the parish church of Pretty, high on top of the Mendips, they have an old saying that goes, as sure as our Lord was at Pretty. And the school children at Pretty sing a carol that begins, Joseph with a tin merchant, a tin merchant, a tin merchant. And it goes on to describe him arriving from the sea in a boat. Although the beginning of the tin trade in Britain is lost in the midst of time, it is known that the greatest tin mines of the first century AD were on the western coastlands of Cornwall in southern England. Today, the area is studded with crumbling brick stacks and gaunt granite ruins that once housed the steam engines that provided power to lift the ore from the pits. 
However, these relics are the remains and debris of an industry having its roots in biblical antiquity. Since earliest times, the old smelling places of Cornwall have been referred to as Jews' houses, meaning, of course, Judaites, from the Israelite tribe of Judah to which Joseph of Arimathea belonged. Historical evidence exists that the tribe of Asher was also associated with the tin mines of Cornwall. Camden, in his first volume of Britannica, published in 1808, states clearly, The merchants of Asher worked the tin mines of Cornwall not as slaves, but as masters and exporters. One English historian wrote concerning the metal trade of Britain, The British mines mainly supplied the glorious adornment of Solomon's temple. This takes us back at least 1000 BC. The many mine shafts that today dot the southern Cornish coastlands only date back to the Middle Ages. At the time of Joseph, mining of tin consisted of washing it out of the alluvial deposits along the banks of the Cornish rivers, such as the lovely Dart, a Celtic word meaning oak stream, and the Fowlery River, which in turn is a Celtic word that means beach river. The tin recovered would have looked like grains of sand and would sometimes be melted into ingots for ease of shipping. Many such ingots have been found in Cornwall by archaeologists excavating ancient tin mining sites along the riverbanks. In the Truro Museum in Cornwall can be seen one such pre-Roman relic dredged up from the Fall Estuary in 1812. It is known as the St. Maw's Tin Ingot and weighs about 158 pounds. It is well known that a flourishing metal trade existed between Britain and the Mediterranean as far back as 1500 BC when fleets of sailing vessels similar to this model in a Cornish museum continually plied their trade between Palestine, Egypt, Greece, and the western Mediterranean ports. The Greek historian Herodotus, writing in the 5th century BC, describes the Phoenician ships, known as Hippos, that engaged in the metal trade with the British Isles, known to him as the Tin Islands. Archaeological evidence of such Phoenician ships was found on a wall relief in the ruins of the palace of Sargon II of Assyria. The mural depicts the Phoenician merchant ships towing timbers. Diodorus, writing in the first century BC, wrote how tin, after being mined, was carried in mule-drawn wagons to an island in Britain, joined to the mainland at low tide. It was known as Ictus. Just such an island exists, St. Michael's Mount, off the coast of Mary Zion in Cornwall. During the ebb of the tide, a strip of ground is left dry, and visitors may walk across to the island with dry feet. This was a phenomenon noted in the ancient descriptions of Ictus. The island and the castle are open to the public, so I joined the stream of visitors from the mainland who daily cross the causeway to the island. During the ebb of the tide, I might add, the mount is dedicated to St. Michael the Archangel, who, it is claimed, appeared to a group of fishermen in 495 AD on a ledge high above the waves on the western side of the island. The top of the rock on which the castle is built is more than 200 feet above the sea level. And in the courtyard of the castle are displayed guns taken from the wreck of a French frigate driven aground during the Napoleonic Wars. Queen Victoria visited the mount and the castle in 1846. The present harbor of the island dates only from the 14th century. However, the foundation stones could be centuries older. The Church of St. Michael also dates from the 14th century. And doing repairs, the skeleton of a nine-foot giant was found under the chancel floor. Nearby is St. Michael's Cemetery that has served the inhabitants of the island for over 1,000 years. In the little museum on St. Michael's Island, are displayed relics of the 14th century along with seashells and one object that provided the very evidence I was searching for in Cornwall, archaeological evidence of Phoenician trade for metal in Britain. Asking permission, I was allowed to take it out in the sunlight for filming. 
a stone bowl found by skin divers in the harbor just a few weeks before my visit. Unmistakably a Phoenician stone bowl of a type used between 1500 and 1000 BC. A bowl that could have been used to measure tin or other metals which were collected from the sands in those early days as washed grains of metal. Oops, I think we overstayed our visit to the island. Sorry about that. We're going to have to wade back. Looking back on the little island, it is easy to imagine the Phoenician ships with their colorful sails come racing in from the sea, lowering their linen sails as they inch their way into the ancient harbor with the power of oars, finally dropping their stone anchors into the still water. The South Cornish coast provides the setting for several ancient traditions of Joseph bringing the boy Jesus to Britain. The local inhabitants of the Cornish town of Lou have an old saying when they see a long-haired person. Better go and get an haircut, or folks will say, is Joseph of Arimathea come back? The town of Lou is divided by the River Lou into East Lou and West Lou. The town of East Lou has a ship on its coat of arms, bringing, I was told, Joseph and the boy Jesus to Cornwall. And this tradition is portrayed on the back and the front of the old guild hall of East Lou. This painting, verified by the town clerk, shows the official badge as it should be with Jesus and Joseph aboard their trading vessel. A local story handed down from generation to generation by the farmers along the coast of Cornwall tells of a boy and his uncle that once landed on an island about a mile off the coast of Lou during a storm. St. George's Island. The ancient inhabitants of the area were so anxious to protect them from the storm that they went to a local giant and asked him to build a hedge to protect them. But when it blows here, it really blows. Now, whether you do or do not believe giants once existed in Cornwall, the fact remains that there is a giant hedge in the form of an ancient earthwork running up the bare Cornish hills and down to a little valley. And it is called the Giant's Hedge. Nearby Place Manor also plays a part in the old traditions Tin and lead was once collected here for overseas trade. The old carvings on the early Norman arch of the Manor Chapel are over 1,000 years old and contain signs of an anchor and a lamb and cross insignia, a symbol of Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God. It is believed they depict the ancient tradition of Place Manor, that Joseph and Jesus were once forced to seek shelter from a storm off St. Anthony's Head where the modern lighthouse now stands. They found safe anchorage in the lee of the headland where the old church of Place Manor is now situated. Another ancient legend repeated by the older folks of the district is that Jesus and Joseph once came and anchored in St. Just Creek while visiting the tin mines of Western Cornwall. Since ancient tin mines do exist in the area, I decided to visit them in the hope of finding evidence of the mining of tin in the time of Christ, as I had done on the mining of lead in the Mindips. Being a stranger to the area, I soon became hopelessly lost and did the only proper thing to do when one is lost, ask for directions. The old folks of Cornwall are very friendly. I hope, noticing the sickle in her hand. Soon, not only did I get directions, but when I explained my mission, I got a lecture about St. Joseph of Arimathea. Did I know that when the tin miners flashed their tin, they sang a chant that said, Joseph was in the tin trade, and that Jesus himself taught the miners how to extract tin from ore? Finally, I heard what I was waiting for. If I would just continue straight along, I'd cross an old Roman road used by wagons that once carried the metal from the mines, which were just over to the left. 
With proper directions, I soon found the site where two rich lodes or veins of tin were once mined. Both bore interesting names. One was called Corpus Christi, which means body of Christ. And the other was called Wheel of Jesus. Wheel is an old Cornish word for mine. Groups of stones remaining from the walls of ancient stone huts of the miners mark the site of the old Ding Dong mine, where Cornish legends say Jesus once worked as a young miner. Dotted about the tin mining area of Cornwall are a number of very ancient Celtic crosses known as tunic crosses. They are found only in Cornwall. Nowhere else in the British Isles do they exist. They can be seen along roadsides and in local churchyards. They are made of local stone and on one side have a crudely cut Christian cross. And on the other side, the figure of what can only be a young boy, certainly not an adult. He is dressed in a knee-length tunic. Not a crucified Christ nailed to a cross, but a youth with his arms outstretched in an attitude of blessing. These crosses may well portray an age-old memory of the visits of the boy Jesus to these shores in the company of his uncle Joseph. The metal trade routes from the continent passed around the southern tip of England and up along the western rocky coast of Cornwall toward the Bristol Channel, passing by Padstow. In olden days, Padstow was a town near where ships could find safe harbor and fresh water in the broad estuary of the Camel River. And legend has it that Jesus and Joseph often stopped here for water. Near the mouth of the estuary is located a local well called Jesus' Well, a name whose origin is lost in the mist of antiquity. One of the most interesting of the ancient traditions of Glastonbury is that shortly after the age of 12, Jesus' earthly father, Joseph the Carpenter, died. Then Jesus' uncle, Joseph of Arimathea, took Jesus and his mother Mary to Britain, arriving first on the western coastlands of England, before making their way inland to a place near the present town of Glastonbury, once known as the Isle of Avalon. Here, Joseph established a home for Mary and the boy Jesus. After his return to Palestine, legend has it, the ruins of his home existed for many years, the site of which is covered today by the ruins of the great Glastonbury Abbey. This Glastonbury Abbey provides the strongest link between history and legend of the Lamb of God walking upon England's mountains green. Since time immemorial, pilgrims from all corners of the earth have visited and continue to visit this holy shrine. There is little doubt but that the Glastonbury Abbey is the oldest religious foundation in the British Isles. This is only a model of Walla construction and shows how that church may have looked. For the original shape was most likely round, as were other structures found of that period. The Waddle Church, or its ruins, must have been in existence at the time of Augustine's visit to Britain in A.D. 600. He wrote a letter to Pope Gregory in Rome, which reads, In the western confines of Britain, there is a certain royal island of large extent, surrounded by water, abounding in all the beauties of nature and necessities of life. In it, the first neophytes of Catholic law found a church constructed by no human art, but by the hands of Christ himself. By the hands of Christ himself? Two early British historians believed it and conveyed the thought in their writings. Truly, Glastonbury is the holiest earth of England. Read St. David's life, and there ye may see that our Lord it hallowed with his own hand. We certainly know that Christ, the true Son, afforded his light, the knowledge of his precepts, to our island in the last year in the reign of Tiberius Caesar. Since Tiberius died A.D. 37, Gildas probably means that the light of the gospel reached Britain in that year only four years after the resurrection. 
Although today Glastonbury is surrounded by meadows, in ancient times it was an island back of a large oozy estuary bearing the name Innes Whitman or Glass Island. It later became known as Insuli Avalonia, or Isle of the Apple Trees. Its moist ground and atmosphere was found to be favorable for the cultivation of apples, the production of which eventually spread to all parts of the British Isles. Dominating the landscape is the Glastonbury Tor or Mount, rising to a height of about 500 feet and once a place of Druidic worship. Archaeological excavations have found the area around Glastonbury was once a marshy tract. This is a model of a lake village excavated near Glastonbury, a settlement built on pilings and fillings surrounded by water with a causeway to the mainland. The village covered some three acres and contained over 80 circular huts or dwellings and was occupied at the time of Christ. Now we let time slip away. Jesus reaches manhood, returns to his homeland in Palestine to take up his ministry, which ends in his death on Calvary. Our next Glastonbury tradition starts after the resurrection of Christ. Joseph of Arimathea with Mary, the mother of Jesus, and other disciples were expelled from Jerusalem by the Jewish Sanhedrin. Forced by boat off the coast of Caesarea, the little party of refugees made their way west as far as Marseille, France. Later, Joseph and 11 companions with Mary continued on across France and embarked on a ship to Falmouth, England. From there, they boarded another ship which took them around the southwestern tip of England, whose jagged cliffs are pictured here. Confirmation for the coming of Joseph and his companions to Britain after the resurrection is found in the writings of Eusebius, the great historian and bishop of Caesarea, in AD 260, which states, The apostles passed beyond the ocean to the isles called the Britannic Isles. Then sailing northward, following the west coast of England, the little party would have encountered the most hazardous part of their journey. The rocky coastland of Cornwall has been the graveyard of countless numbers of ships. Due to the dense fog that often conceals the jagged rocks that protrude out into the sea, and the sudden storm that send giant waves crashing against the shore. Finally, Joseph and his friends reach what is today called the Severn Sea and the western coastland of Somerset, which in those days was a marshy track with navigable rivers. Entering the estuary of the River Brew, they made their way to a little island about 12 miles in from the coast. Additional support for the coming of Joseph and his companions to Britain is found in several other sources. Polydor Virgil, the learned Italian historian visited in England, wrote, Britain, partly through Joseph of Arimathea, was of all kingdoms first to receive the gospel. This was recognized by four church councils of the 15th century, which held that the churches of France and Spain must yield in point of antiquity to that of Britain, as the latter church was founded by Joseph of Arimathea immediately after the Passion of Christ. Finally, their long journey was over. The Isle of Avalon, the boyhood home of Jesus, was in sight. When Joseph and his friends landed on the sacred Isle of Avalon, it was during the month of December. Some authorities hold that it happened to be Christmas Day. They climbed a little hill called to this day We're All or Weary All Hill. And perhaps as an ancient form of claim to the land or to indicate his journey was over, Joseph thrust his staff or perhaps the staff of Christ himself into the ground. In the moist ground, the staff in a short time took root, 
budded and blossomed, and eventually grew into the famous Glastonbury thorn. It was during the ascendancy of the fanatics among the Puritans that it was cut down. Its executioners justified the vandalism by declaring that the tree had become an object of idolatry. But the hawthorn is a tree of great virility, and soon new growths sprang up from the roots. A metal enclosure now protects the descendant of the original thorn tree. And a stone on the ground marks the spot where the original thorn tree grew. In the Glastonbury Abbey grounds is a thorn tree grown by the method of grafting from the original. The strange blooming propensity of this thorn tree around Christmas time, as well as in May, does substantiate its claim of its origin in Palestine, because the natural blooming period of the Levantine thorn is December, whereas the native thorn of Britain blossoms only in May. Another thorn tree is located in the churchyard of St. John's Baptist Church in Glastonbury. This tree, as well as all others, grafted from the original, keep the habit of blooming both in May and again in December. The miraculous budding of the staff was accepted as a token of a divine mission by the king of the country, Abaragus by name, and cousin of the great Caracas. The king received the refugees kindly and gave them 12 hides of land, about 1,900 acres, in Innes Whitron, described as a marshy track. In the public record house in London can be found historical confirmation of the 1,900 acres of land mentioned in the traditions. It is found in the famous Doomsday Book of Britain. The Domus Dei, the great monastery at Glastonbury called the Secret of the Lord. This Glastonbury church has in its own villa 12 hides of land which have never paid tax. The stone marking the eastern boundary of the 12 hides of land can be seen in a local parish church graveyard. A hide of land was regarded as being that acreage which would maintain one man for one year, about 160 acres. The coming of Joseph to Britain is commemorated in many church windows in Somerset and Cornwall counties. One is found in the Abbey Church at Bath. It shows Joseph holding his famous staff, which is bursting into blossoms as he thrusts it into the fertile soil of Glastonbury, as his followers look on, some of whom are women. For many years, a custom prevailed in Glastonbury. A cutting was taken each Christmas from the thorn tree and presented to the reigning monarch. For a time, the custom fell into disuse, but was reinstated by His Majesty King George V. Since that time, every year, a sprig of this historical little tree is sent to the reigning sovereign as a Christmas decoration. The present Queen Elizabeth II is now a recipient of this age-old custom. Additional confirmation of Joseph coming to Britain is found in the chronicles of the eminent 12th century British historian William of Malmesbury, a man noted for the accuracy of his work. In the year 1126, he recorded the story of Joseph in a book in these words. In the year of our Lord, 12 holy missionaries with Joseph of Arimathea at their head came over to Britain preaching the incarnation of Jesus Christ. The king, at their petition, gave them for their habitation a certain island bordering on this region, surrounded by marshes called Innis Witrin. These holy men built a chapel of the form of that which had been shown them. The walls were of osseas wattled together. Although rude and misshapen in form, it was in many ways adorned with heavenly virtues. The words described in the chapel as, quote, in a form that had been shown them, unquote, are intriguing. Did they find the earlier home of Mary and the boy Jesus, but probably in ruins? And was it used as a model or itself rebuilt into a home for Mary? 
and after her death, used at a chapel? We read of the Waddle Church, or Old Church, being encased in boards and covered with lead. Later, a stone church was erected over it. Thus, the old church was preserved intact inside. The ruins of Mary's Chapel at Glastonbury today covers the site of the original Waddle Church, known as the Caldy Church or Church of the Refugees, a title that adhered to the early British church for many centuries. To many, these ruins of the Glastonbury Abbey mark the site of the first Christian church in Britain, hallowed by the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ. grew up a mighty monastery, only to be destroyed by the disastrous fire of May the 24th, 1184, that reduced to a heap of ashes all the wonderful buildings, including the venerable Waddle Church, its origin rooted in the traditions of Glastonbury. That same year, however, Henry II issued a royal charter to rebuild Glastonbury. The charter itself gives testimony to the truth of the tradition. In its description of the site as the mother and burying place of the saints, founded by the very disciples of our Lord. This sketch illustrates its completion in A.D. 1539. On the right is Mary's Chapel, which replaced the original Waddle Church, built on this site by St. Joseph, and perhaps on a foundation laid by Jesus himself. It is the ruins of this rebuilding of the Glastonbury Abbey in the 12th century that one sees today. Mary's Chapel, even in its ruined condition, is considered extremely beautiful. Its dimensions significantly match those of the tabernacle, as described in the book of Exodus. One of the most unique monuments that remains from olden times is an ancient stone that silently stares down on the beholder from the still standing south wall of the Lady Chapel. This time and weather-worn tablet has puzzled the scholars for centuries. It bears but two names, Jesus, Maria. Quite obviously, an enormous amount of respect is paid to this sacred chapel by clergy and laymen alike. Each year, special commemorative services are held at Glastonbury when the Church of England sends representative choirs for the annual ceremony of rededication to Christ. These services are held in Mary's Chapel, whose foundation may have been laid by Christ himself. Glastonbury is the cradle of English Christianity and has been a light in ages of cynicism, darkness, and anxiety. This light was carried by Celtic missionaries to all parts of the British Isles and France. In recognition of this ancient ground, Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth presented a simple wooden cross to mark the site of this Christian monument. Its inscription reads, The cross, the symbol of our faith, the gift of Queen Elizabeth II, marks a Christian sanctuary so ancient that only legend can record its origin. It was during the dissolution of the monasteries under Henry VIII that Thomas Cromwell sealed the fate of the Glastonbury community with these words. Item, the abbot of Glaston to be tried at Glaston and also to be executed there. It was the destruction of the monastery by Cromwell that reduced the abbey to the forlorn state we see today. However, from the remaining ruins, we can see the architecture of the great abbey was very fine and pure early Gothic. The great church was built in the traditional cruciform design, the bays forming the arms of a cross. The abbey has not always enjoyed the peace that surrounds it today. When changes were introduced by a Norman abbot, the Saxon monks rebelled and refused to obey. The Anglo-Saxon Chronicle of AD 1083 records how arrows stuck in the crucifix that stood above the altar and the wretched monks lay around the altar and blood ran onto the steps. Little remains of the abbot's great hall where important guests were once entertained. Only fragments of the southwest corner can be seen today by visitors 
to the Abbey. But the kitchen that once served the abbots and their guests is still standing. Built in the 14th century by Abbot Brayton, it remains roofed and complete with four walls and has four amiss chimneys in the corners of the interior. Flues are carried up the corners to the lantern on the roof. The kitchen is used today as the Abbey Museum. The kitchen's ornate roof drain spouts are over 500 years old and are fine examples of 14th century building decorations. Nearby is the old fish pond of the Abbey that still provides fresh fish for the Tom Sawyers of the town. Just outside the walls of the Abbey is George or Pilgrim's Inn, built in 1475. Over its doorway can be seen three shields. One contains a St. George cross, and the center one the arms of Edward IV. It is recorded that the cross was conferred on George here in this building. Just a few steps up the street is the courthouse of Glaston 12 Hydes, where once all legal cases were heard. It was also built in the 15th century. One of the traditions of Glastonbury is that King Arthur and his queen, Guinevere, were buried in the abbey grounds. And today, a small marker indicates where their remains were found by Edward I. In the year 1191, the bodies of King Arthur and his queen were said to have been found on the south side of the Lady Chapel. On the 19th of April, 1278, their remains were removed in the presence of King Edward I and Queen Eleanor to a black marble tomb on this site. This tomb survived until the dissolution of the Abbey in 1539. A leaden cross was found in the grave. Its inscription read, Here lies interred in the Isle of Avalon, the renowned King Arthur. The genealogy of King Arthur, as given by the historian John of Glastonbury, lists Arthur as the tenth descendant of St. Joseph of Arimathea. We read where King Arthur and his knights of the round table bound themselves in solemn oath to find the Holy Grail. These valiant descendants of Joseph braved many hazards in fruitless search. Some of our most beautiful literature is written around the quest of the Holy Chalice. We are still intrigued with the mystery of the cup of the Last Supper. What was its ultimate fate? The answer may well lie in the Glastonbury tradition, which says that Joseph had the cup in his possession when he arrived at Avalon. He is said to have buried it within the cloaking earth of Chalice Hill. It is quite significant that at the foot of Chalice Hill, where Joseph and his companions erected their wild church, is located a well, encompassed by a beautiful garden. A fountain has been constructed in the center of the garden, so visitors may drink of the waters of the well. It is the antiquity of the well itself that is significant. Since earliest times, it has been known by two names, Chalice Well and Holy Well. The well runs as a spring, producing over 25,000 gallons of water daily. The modern well lid is patterned after a 13th century design and symbolizes the bleeding lamps and the visible and invisible worlds interlocked with one another. Roses commemorate the Rose of Sharon whose feet may have tread this very site. That the cup of the Last Supper was brought to Glastonbury and buried there has been firmly believed for over 1,000 years. The strength of this belief is shown to us in the many poems, songs, and stories that abound. Tennyson immortalized the tradition of the cup coming to Glastonbury in his poem, The Cup of the Last Supper. The cup 
The cup itself, which our Lord drank at the last sad supper with his own. This from the blessed land of Amamat. After the day of darkness, when the dead went wandering over Moriah, the good saint, Arimathean Joseph, journeying, brought to Glastonbury. While colorful and romantic stories picture the cup of the Last Supper as a gold or a silver chalice, even the Holy Grail of the King Arthur legends, one is inclined to believe the cup was a plain wooden drinking vessel, as was widely used in the Middle East at the time of Christ. Just such a cup exists in the Nanios Manor of Wales, once the home of the Powell family. The history of this cup can be traced back to the Glastonbury Abbey at the time of its destruction by Cromwell. The cup, known as the Nanios Cup, was found in the walls of the Glastonbury Abbey and hidden by the monks from the destroyers. It was later carried for safety to Wales and placed in the hands of the Powell family with the charge until the church should claim her own. It is quite possible that these fragile remains of an Hollywood cup now crudely riveted together are 2,000 years old. This time-worn Hollywood cup is traced back to Glastonbury, but does it reach beyond to Palestine? The only witnesses to this secret lie mute in the tombs of the monks who brought the cup with reverent care to Nanios Manor centuries ago. Some may scorn traditions and decry all legends, but can they be sure it is inconceivable that the cup of the Last Supper was brought to Glastonbury by Joseph of Arimathea with the Christian gospel around 8037? For centuries, many folks have believed this is the cup of the Last Supper from which Christ drank with his own. Records state that Joseph was laid to rest by the Wild Church in 8082. Malgren of Flangdorf, the uncle of St. David of Wales, in AD 450 wrote, The Isle of Avalon, greedy for burials, received thousands, amongst whom was Joseph de Marmor of Arimathea, who entered his perpetual sleep. And he lies in a forked line near the southern angle of the oratory made of wattle. In the north transept of St. John's Church in Glastonbury can be seen a stone sarcophagus found in 1929, lifted out of the ground by frost. The tomb bears the initials J.A. carved upon it. A 14th century monk, Roger of Boston, recorded the tomb had an epitaph attached to it, which read in Latin, I came to the Britain after I buried Christ. I taught, I rest. Throughout Somerset County, there is hardly a church without a window or statue depicting Joseph of Arimathea and often with the boy Jesus. The evidence of their presence in Britain is now too strongly established to be brushed aside as it has been in the past. In actuality, Joseph of Arimathea, the noblest de Curion, the uncle of Jesus and guardian of the Blessed Virgin, was the Apostle of Christ to Britain. William Blake was so impressed with the story of Joseph coming to Britain that Joseph became the subject of one of his first engravings. On the original engraving, Blake wrote that Michelangelo painted it. So the Italian school of art must have known the story of Joseph in the 16th century. Yes, the Holy Lamb of God did walk upon England's mountains green. And it was not without reason that William Blake penned his famous Glastonbury hymn with its haunting and challenging question.
What a fantastic film, Traditions of Glastonbury. We're privileged to have here in our studios Mr. E. Raymond Capp, biblical archaeologist and historian. Mr. Capp, welcome to the studios of Shepherd's Chapel, and we really appreciate you bringing that film to us. It's a pleasure being here, sir. How did you become first interested in Glastonbury? Well, Glastonbury, I was a contractor. I had seven daughters and two boys to raise, and I had to feed them. And I had to do contracting for business. Well, my secretary one day brought me in a book for Christmas and said, here's a present for you, Ray. Laid in the desk. It's called The Drama of the Lost Disciples. I remember taking the book. Okay, I'll read it. Just sit there and sit there. And every few months, yet, when you read that book, would you believe one year went by? And finally, she started on about it. And I said, Ion, shut up. Stop bugging me. I'll take it home read it tonight. Start read it. Start it. Took it home. And I didn't put that book down. I finished it at 4 o'clock in the morning. It turned me on. That subject, and I, that's what the book did it. Yeah. Tell us a little bit about the book. Well, the drum lost disciples, uh, it talks about Christ coming to uh, England. Mm -hmm. uh, it talks about Joseph Arimathea. It had the very things that I've later put into a book called Traditions of Glastonbury. But that was a book that motivated me to start. Mm -hmm. And I had to see it for myself. And my wife got a job in a pottery factory to raise the money, and I paid my way for, I went over there for five weeks. I dumped all the business in her lap. I had a contract of business going. You pay the bill, here's the check, you take care of everything. I dumped it all in her lap. That's an understanding wife. I'll tell you something. She wanted she didn't dump me. I did five weeks with a little automatic camera. I couldn't read a light meter. I had an automatic camera. And I made my, I just had to tell everybody. I took slides and took this picture. So that was the beginning of my film career. <laughs> you say this changed your life. How did it change your life? Well, I became intensely interested more and more in the Bible, and mainly I wanted to tell everybody this. To me, the life of Christ is the uh, most interesting subject I could talk about, and I wanted to tell everybody. So I started giving lectures using slides. Remember, I'm not a speaker. I'm a writer. You, you probably know that. I feel if you're looking at a picture, you don't look at me. I'm, I got my notes. You're looking at a slide or a picture over here when I'm giving a lecture. And I found more and more people interested. In fact, that's what got me started in uh, teaching people interested in uh, slides. Visual aid is the way to go, I felt. In fact, you realize I'm now in a video for that reason. So I just had to tell everybody I know, and I stopped in the street and give them books. I bought all the books the dramas had in this country, give them away. Couldn't get any more. Then I started wrote my own. Well, your education and background was all in archaeology and history. And I, I can imagine, and I, I've seen here at the chapel, how difficult it is to put productions together. How in the world did you learn to make film? <laughs> it's quite a process. Uh, I went to a... I knew I had to have help. I came back from this trip the first time. I had so many footage, a couple thousand foot of footage. It wasn't much of good. I had to have help. I had to find an, somebody to help me do a cameraman. So I went to a cameraman and told him what I wanted to do. I need some help. You go to England with me. And the fellow named Ray House, he said, well, how much foot are you going to buy to start with? And I told him how many feet I had. He said, that's about one to one. I'm shooting about four to one. He said, what's your budget? I told him, my gosh, you can't do that. I said, that's all the money I got. I'll tell you what I'll do. I'm on vacation. I'll just pay my expenses and I'll take it. I'll go with you. So he went with me. That's why I finished, made the first film right there. We went back, we've been eight weeks later on. Because I'd go, before I went to him, in fact, his name was given to me by another filmmaker I went to ask help on. I said, I need some help, I can make a film. Well, that's fine, who's the a, who's a producer? Well, I am. Uh, who wrote it? I did. Who's your cameraman? <laughs> me. And I said, well, how can I help you? I said, I need some help on how to read this light meter and load my camera. He said, my gosh. And you think you can make a film? You got the nerve to think you can? Okay. I got the nerve to think I can help you. Sit down and talk about it. An hour later, I go out there knowing how to load the camera and read it, but I still tight on the light meter. I realized that's when I started in, I realized I had to have help. That's when, when he told me another fellow that does a cameraman could help me. So that's my experience as a cameraman. <laughs> We're so glad you learned, and uh, Traditions of Glastonbury was your first video, is that first not one, correct? Yeah. And turned out tremendously. Uh, thank you for joining us today in the studios, Mr. Cap, and thank you for Traditions of Glastonbury. 
Uh, we're going to have for you now the information on how you can order the book traditions of Glastonbury and also the video through Shepherd's Chapel so that you can share this historical uh, account of where Jesus Christ was between the age of 12 and 30. Fascinating book. Don't miss this chance to share it with others. Listen a moment, won't you please? The book, Traditions of Glastonbury, by E. Raymond Cap is our item number six, and the suggested donation is $10. Mr. Cap is a biblical archaeologist and historian. This book historically documents the whereabouts of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, from his early teens until he was approximately 30 years of age. The Traditions of Glastonbury records facts that prove Jesus and Mary's uncle, Joseph of Arimathea, traveled to the British Isles.